being seven o'clock, we'll get the meeting underway. Um, this meeting of the uh, Reading Municipal Light Department Board of Commissioners is being videotaped uh, here at the RMLD's office at 230 Ash Street um, for distribution to the community TV stations in Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment, especially tonight, um, and uh, at the discretion of the chair on items on the agenda and not on the official agenda. We just ask that all questions or comments be directed to the chair and that everybody be light and courteous. Um, and tonight with, with our solar workshop, what we're gonna do is after we have presentations, we will have invite people to come and um, hopefully it's not too intimidating, actually come up to the podium so that you can stand there and ask. That way your question and your comment is gonna be heard by everybody, including the cable TV folks. Um, if you ask it from there, then nobody will be able to see or hear what you're saying. So, can you hear me? You can't hear me? Okay. Yeah. Hold on a second. That's just for TV. We have AV problems. Colleen has left the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it is a cloudy, it's a cloudy day, so, um, with, with apologies to Tom for this joke, you know, we're gonna change the topic to battery storage, not solar. <laughs> or hydro, we could do hydro. Hydro, too. hydro, thank you. We yeah, should have worked on the bad joke from the beforehand. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. So we're working, I think we have an AV issue. Um, well, there's no microphone, that's just for the okay. TV. You just got to be loud. Okay, so basically we just started the meeting and um, and I'm just going to get started. My name is Dave Talbot. I'm the, uh, the chair of the board, and my colleagues here are very happy to have you here for this uh, solar workshop. I would like to just introduce the topic briefly and, uh, and say that um, this is a little bit different than the usual meeting in that you know we're, the point is to engage with the public in explaining policies, the institutional roles, and programs related to solar generation. Um, as you probably all know, in theory, our energy future can be based on renewables and nuclear. Uh, coupled with storage uh, and with a lot of efficiency mixed in and get us away uh, from primarily fossil fuel burning for all of what we do in our electricity uh, generation and transportation. Um, so this meeting uh, is about the role RMLD can play locally uh, within RMLD's business model. Um, it's a complicated topic and I know there's been some questions and confusion over the years about you know how, how do we do this um, and it's more complicated certainly than just using electricity and, and RMLD buying and selling it. Um, so in discussing, you know, the communications issues, um, you know, in discussing with staff, Colleen O'Brien, our general manager, that, and for Charles Underhill, who's our director of integrated resources, who will be giving a presentation shortly to explain the programs that we offer and, and take many of your questions. And thank you for your help. Seats. Many seats right up front. <laughs> Welcome, thank you. Um, uh, just a couple of quick comments about, you know, there's a few different models for doing this, which Chuck will explain. You, know, you have residential, you have, you can do um, solar on a municipal property, like a school, um, or, you know, commercial industrial could do, could do a solar project. The models can be different depending on the scale and the type of um, entity that's involved. Um, a quick context, um, since we have some municipal officials in the room, thank you for coming. I'll give you a quick context on the municipal piece. Um, you know, you know, towns or cities that are that are doing this on public property, like a school. We have 351 towns or cities in the state of, of a Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Of these 351, 200 of them are doing some type of uh, municipal-centric project uh, in, in their territory, uh, and this includes. Um, 122 have two or more systems, and of these, um, 20 of these communities are served by municipal light plants, uh, such as RMLD. There's 40, of, uh, not to get too into the weeds, but there's 40 municipal or 41 or two in the state municipal utilities like RMLD, and they serve 46 communities, towns, or cities. And so 20 of those have some type of municipal uh, solar generation facility at the light plant or the town. Um, at this time, um, we serve four communities, as you know, Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and part of Linfield. Uh, and we have not yet, um, you know, there's a lot of discussions, but there's not yet been a, a municipal building solar array, either rooftop, canopy, or, or other. And the RMLD looks forward to assisting any municipality who might wish to pursue this 
and explore the feasibility. And Chuck will be explaining some of how that could happen. Um, and now I'll just give you a quick bit of the structure of the meeting. Um, Chuck, or the aforementioned Charles Underhill, Director of Integrated Resources, is going to give a presentation uh, to walk you through these pieces. And then most importantly, we're going to have a nice long period of time for questions and dialogue. And when we do that, uh, just to reiterate, we'd have you come up and uh, first of all, I'd like you to take the municipal questions first, meaning from the towns, governments, then residential, and then others after that. So we'll kind of break it into those three chunks of, of questions. Um, and we'd ask that you, you do come up to the podium and, um, and, and address your comments and questions from the podium and try to keep it brief so we can get, have people uh, all have a chance to have, ask questions. With that, uh, I hand it to Colleen to for the okay. Yes, thank you and good evening. I'm so glad everyone came. Nice big full house. I'm just going to turn it over to Chuck, but I just want to give a special thanks to um, Tracy, my assistant, and Joyce Mulvaney, our communications manager, and er everybody else on the team that helped put this together. So thanks a lot, and take it over, Chuck. So while Joyce is loading this, is there anybody that can't hear me? <laughs> My voice carries. Uh, I have experience as a swimming official. I can yell down a 50-meter pool, and the kids will stop running. <laughs> so good evening and welcome. Um, as you know, the uh, presentation this evening is on camera. Uh, if you want to come up and ask your question through the podium, that's fine. Uh, we also have an empty seat over on the other side, if that's easier to get to. And uh, I believe that uh, Vivek is glad to share his microphone this evening uh, with, with anybody that uh, would prefer to ask their question from over there. Uh, what I wanted to do this evening was sort of level set uh, everybody's expectations about solar. Uh, there have been uh, a number of issues floating around solar. Uh, for quite a while that affect uh, the design of uh, the systems that we build, uh, the cost effectiveness of the systems, how we price incentives, and uh, a whole slew of other things that, that occur with the solar market. So uh, what I want to do is uh, very briefly, I was told, go through uh, a slide deck and sort of uh, lay out uh, the considerations that uh, go with solar these days. So. I'm going to figure out which button actually advances the slides and which ones turn it off and kill the computer for the <laughs> evening. <laughs> so uh, I've broken this into four sections, solar economics and impacts, uh, system examples, uh, RMLD's own solar goals and objectives, and then current RMLD and other uh, solar uh, activities that are going on. So let's start with solar economics. Um, first thing is actually fitting solar uh, to the load profile. Um, and I've put together uh, a case example this evening that shows what a residential load profile looks like and what a solar profile looks like. And in order to structure this example, uh, I sized the solar system so that it would produce 9,500 kilowatt hours which is the average number of kilowatt hours that a residential customer in Massachusetts or in RMLD's service territory uses. In fact, I took a thousand customers, aggregated them up, and, and came up with a profile that way. So I'm comparing apples and oranges, and you'll be able to see uh, how the profiles fit together and uh, then what the uh, <coughs> structure uh, of the production and consumption looks like. So. Uh, we also have uh, a number of distribution utility uh, options. Um, we have uh, what's called net metering every place else. We have a uh, consumer behind the meter uh, generation uh, here in RMLD. Um, this is 
not sustainable if we do it on what most people understand to be net metering, which is the same price in and out. Uh, it costs money for RMLD to provide uh, backup uh, service to the solars, to bank uh, the solar kilowatt hours, and to uh, provide energy uh, at night uh, when the solar isn't uh, operating. So uh, there are costs that we need to recover, and there are strategies and structures uh, that utilities uh, are putting in place to do that. So this is the, the, the profile curve, and the blue line is solar production. Uh, this is uh, for July, um, and what you'll see is uh, the yellow line, when it is above the blue line, uh, is when the uh, solar location is consuming more power than it is using. And when the blue line is above the yellow line, the system is producing more energy than the customer is consuming. Uh, over time, over the course of a, a full year, uh, you actually use about 40%, 45% of the energy directly and immediately. The other 55% requires a banking activity to do. So it's over 50%. Uh, over the course of a year requires the banking and the interconnection with the utility to be able to work. Now, these are all done uh, to the same scale. Uh, so in July, we're looking at the output from a 6.3 megawatt uh, kilowatt uh, residential system. This is the load profile in uh, December. And you'll notice that the solar production drops rather dramatically and narrows. Uh, you'd expect that because of the hours of darkness. And the load profile um, follows fairly closely to uh, where it is uh, in July. So uh, this is where actually the consumers are using uh, more of the resources uh, from RMLD than they are actually producing from the solar system. So um, these slides will be available. Um, but I put together uh, a summary uh, so that you can see uh, how it goes out from month-to-month uh, -month basis. The first column is the consumption for the average residential consumer. It totals about 9,500 kilowatt hours. Uh, the second column is delivered. The third column is received. The fourth column is the net so that you can track uh, what you would see each month on your banking statement and what would be uh, accumulating uh, in the kilowatt hours. At the end of the year, uh, I've got a 25-kilowatt-hour uh, difference. So I figure that's pretty close to balanced and zero. Um, so when we look at, at solar economics, uh, one of the first questions is, what does it cost? And I went and got some national-level data. Uh, across the United States, the average installed cost per watt of a solar system is about $3.05. Uh, here in Massachusetts, uh, the average cost is $3.29. And when we look at um, the cost of just the panel, not including the labor, not including the inverter, not including the transformer, not including uh, the electronics and, and controls. Uh, it runs about $1.05 um, per panel per year, or per panel. Per watt. Per watt, uh, per watt uh, for just the panel. I'm sorry. Can everybody still see the screen? <laughs> How about now? <laughs> I have a very warped sense of humor. I apologize in advance. So over the last five years, uh, we have seen uh, at the national level a decline in the average installed cost per watt. Uh, it originally started at, uh, well, this is 305. Um, and it's dropped about 2% a year for each of the last five years. So there has not been a precipitous decline in 
uh, the, the cost of solar panels. So it looks like we're getting to a relatively uh, stable pricing structure. So when we talk about federal and state incentives, um, right now there is a federal tax credit that is 30% of the net project costs. That 30% um, ends in December of this year. And it drops to 26% in 2020. So it's about a 4% uh, decrease in the uh, value of the incentive uh, on your federal tax return. Massachusetts tax returns are the lesser of 15% of the net project costs or $1,000. The MLP solar uh, rebate incentive. This is a new program that was put together by the Department of Energy Resources, DOER. Uh, we are working in conjunction with them. Uh, in our service territory, uh, we put uh, $250,000 into the program. DOER is matching it. So we have a $500,000 kitty available in 2019 for us to develop solar projects under 25 kW per location. So that's sort of our uh, resource pool for offering incentives. Uh, DOER uh, has negotiated uh, with everybody and come up with a rate of $1.20 per watt as the incentive to be paid to anybody installing a system. So it's based on the graded size of the system that you're installing. Uh, maximum uh, 25 uh, kW project and as I said it's split 50-50 matching funds uh, with the Commonwealth. This replaces the under 25 uh, kW incentive that we currently have. The over 25 kW incentive stays in place. So um, we're matching the DOER contribution um, of 60 cents per watt uh, this is a one-year program, and then we will pay uh, for over 25 kW uh, up to 50,000 to, uh, we call it commercial, but it's essentially non-residential commercial and municipal systems uh, that are being built. RMLD credits customers the monthly fuel charge for anything that is excess generation. So if you have uh, a credit uh, in any one month on the net amount, we pay the market price for it. So how does this sugar off when we put uh, the cost of the project, uh, the uh, incentive that we offer, the federal tax credit, and the um, uh, Massachusetts tax credit in there. Um, basically for 2019 it is a 6.6 .6 year simple payback uh, on the avoided uh, energy that's being used. Uh, next year, 2020, uh, because of the decrease in the value of the federal incentive, it will go to a seven year payback. <coughs> Excuse me. look at an over 25 kW system, we're starting at a 7.7 .7 year uh, simple payback and going to 8.1. So that gives you the rough comparison uh, in the way the programs are structured and the economic benefit that accrues to the uh, smaller under 25 kW systems. So, so what are some of the impacts that we see to and from solar? Um, the solar production across the United States varies. A lot of it is climate driven. Uh, weather is a big part of it. Cloud cover, precipitation, relative humidity, they all play a big part in it. Um, we have uh, when capacity and transmission peaks occur, the later they occur during the day and the later into the summer season they occur, the smaller is the contribution of solar to offsetting that peak. Um, in 2018, the peak occurred August 28th, and the solar contribution from our two uh, solar choice projects uh, was just over 25% of what the 
project produced. So there's about a 75% derating, if you will, in the ability of a solar project to offset our system peak. Um, we also have uh, an issue with what I will call phantom load. Once a customer has installed a solar system and they're producing uh, for their own need, that load uh, becomes sort of invisible to us, but anything happens to that solar system, we have to step in and fill that need whenever it is. So it's kind of a phantom load for us, and we can't downsize our system for the new load levels that we're experiencing as solar uh, penetrates more and more on the system. So we count on Hamid to oversize our distribution system uh, in order to uh, protect and be able to serve that uh, what I call phantom load. Um, there is another uh, issue, uh, and that is uh, system efficiency. Uh, solar contributes something uh, called power factor. Uh, everybody in here is over 21, right? Okay. No, the no, 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 not everybody. <laughs> no, no, no. Step out of the hall, please. I'm just joking. I'm kidding. Um, anybody who's had a glass of beer, how much foam do you really like with your beer? Hopefully very little. Nobody wants foam, right? All right. Well, that's the problem with solar. Is solar adds foam to the glass. And so we have to provide uh, correction uh, on our system to get rid of that that foam, that, that power factor. It's a piece of the system that uh, we cover for so that we can reduce essentially the losses and put more volume uh, of beer in the glass rather than foam. Um, yeah. <laughs> the other thing, by the way, is, is hours of darkness and how much we have the further north we go uh, over the course of a year. So Hamid is currently working to identify how much solar we can put on each of our feeders. Uh, it depends on the length of the feeder, how much load is currently existing there. Um, and um, right now, we've assumed 15%, uh, and that uh, is on the chart uh, outside. Um, a feeder, uh, for those of you who are wondering, is essentially one of the uh, distribution lines that comes out of a substation and wins its way all over town. So uh, on each of those, um, and I think we've got 20 some odd uh, feeders through, throughout the community, uh, we have to look and see uh, how much load we can put uh, on each of them. Uh, so we start with uh, a conservative assumption and uh, we evaluate what we can put out there without compromising uh, pieces of our system. The other thing uh, on solar, and this is big, um, location, location, location. Do we have any realtors in the <laughs> place? There we go. Okay. How do you sell property? Location, location, location. Same thing in trying to sell solar. Location, location, location. What's the orientation of the house? Is it facing south? Is it facing southeast? Is it facing north? Where do you put the, the panels? What does the roof look like? What is the slope? So either if you've got a flat roof, you can angle the panels appropriately. If you've got a uh, 612 pitch roof, uh, you're kind of stuck putting them up on a 612 pitch. All of that affects the optimum angle at which those panels face the sun. And that affects the production capacity uh, that they will put out. The other thing, and I know this is big and very popular uh, in all four of the towns, trees. Everybody likes trees. Everybody likes nice, tall, shady trees. Everybody but solar likes trees, okay? Uh, they have a very dramatic effect. Uh, they cut down uh, how much sun will actually strike the panels for a good part of the day. So uh, shade is another one of those critical design factors. What happens when uh, all of this is put together is that we sort of get a map that talks about how much 
sun uh, will strike in different areas over the full course of the day, how much it gets diminished by relative humidity, some of the other factors, and we get a map that tells us how many kilowatt hours a day a solar system will produce around the United States. If you look on the map, Arizona and New Mexico are the hot spots for producing solar. Let me tell you how this translates. If you build a solar system in Arizona, it will produce kilowatt hours equal to 35% of the capacity of the system. If you build a solar system in New England, it will produce 16% of the capacity of the system. Now, if the systems both cost about the same, where would you rather build the system? Where you get twice the output uh, down in Arizona. So that's the most economical place to build solar. Um, unfortunately, we're not in Arizona. <laughs> so that gets factored into the economics, and it's one of the reasons that solar seems expensive in New England, because it is. It's per kilowatt hour of production twice as expensive uh, as it is down in Arizona. And what's really bad is, you remember that 305 price and the 329 price? Arizona is what balances Massachusetts to get it to 305. They're down south of $3 a kW to install it. So um, it, it's the situation we deal with, and we just have to factor it into our planning. So per state law, no one can sell kilowatt hours in a municipal service territory, municipal light plant territory. This, is our, this includes RMLD, it includes Peabody, it includes Danvers, uh, it includes Braintree. Uh, every place where there's a municipal utility, we have a state law right to aggregate the load and nobody can come in and sell. What that does um, is take some of the solar models off of the table. There were two companies that were selling solar products in Massachusetts. Uh, one was called Blue Wave. Uh, the other was Solar City, and if any of you had been to uh, Home Depot or Lowe's uh, on a Saturday, there are the Solar City folks uh, trying to get you to buy. Their product, the way they offered it, was they would guarantee you a 10 or a 15 percent discount off of your current electric bill, and they would sell you the kilowatt hours at that discount. They can do that anywhere except the municipal light plant territory. But they're out telling people that the municipal light plants won't build solar. They won't take it. They won't accept it. Not true. We take a lot of it. We've got 7,000 kilowatts of installed solar capacity on our system right now. So uh, we build it, but somebody's out there telling a story that isn't quite true. It just depends on the model. They weren't happy with uh, our receptivity to their model, so uh, they said, Nah, they won't take it. Well, not exactly. So uh, there's a way around um, that for uh, some customers who need it. Uh, municipal light plant customers, including those in the RMLD service territory, either have to own or lease the facilities. Now, this becomes important if you are a tax-exempt customer like a municipal government a church, uh, a not-for-profit school like Austin Prep, where you got a 501c3 or some other tax exemption, you can't claim that 30% federal tax deduction. So you need to structure the deal a little bit differently. And I've done a couple of those deals so that we're able to get the tax credits over to municipalities and tax exempt customers. Uh, it can be done. It just takes a little creativity to get there. Um, so, down here, oh, I lied, I said 7,000, it's 7,655. Um, I have here a slide, it's a little tough to read, but it does have on there the number of customers by town and the installed capacity of the solar systems by town. So we have... Uh, 121 residential customers and 851 
KW of installed solar capacity for residential customers in all four of the communities. Commercial customers, we have 17 accounts with 2,135.4 KW. Those are our behind the meter projects. Those are customer owned generation behind the meter. We also have three projects where we buy the output directly. They are connected to our distribution system. And we buy the output, it goes into our mix, and we're currently working with the legislature to figure out how to count that uh, towards our goals of reducing carbon emissions uh, here in the Commonwealth. And that totals 4,709. So it, it is the biggest piece of the puzzle. Now, uh, for those of you who wonder how a solar system is structured, this slide is pretty much a typical residential system. You see the six solar panels uh, on the roof. Uh, there are uh, protective and control devices next on the system, a junction box, and then we get to the inverter, which converts it from direct current to alternating current and lines it up with uh, the cycles on our system. We're a 60 cycle system. That makes it synchronous with the system. It actually takes the feed from our MLD uh, so that it can uh, sync up the sine waves, essentially. And I know I'm speaking Greek, I apologize. Um, then we have a transformer that changes the voltage up to uh, what's coming into uh, the house. Uh, we have a disconnect switch, uh, makes the fire department very happy, uh, just in case. And then <coughs> This is a little bit different than, than what we actually use. We use one meter, that uses two. So one measures the solar uh, output and the other measures the house consumption and adjusts those. We just have one measure and we take the net of the in and out on it. So where are we? Um, we have solar choice. We allow people to invest in uh, solar panels uh, in projects that uh, the output is sold directly uh, to us. Uh, we have two of those, Solar Choice 1, Solar Choice 2. We're working on Solar Choice 3, uh, and I'm going to have some comments on that in just a minute. We are now doing the DOER uh, Municipal uh, Light Plant Rebate Program, uh, where uh, the incentives are a little richer uh, for this year. We have commercial rebates. And uh, then we have, as I said, the power purchase agreements where we are buying the output from those uh, solar facilities. Um, and everything else is generation behind the meter. So where are we going now? As I said, we're looking at uh, what I'll call a solar garden, solar choice program. I'll explain a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, we have uh, an opportunity uh, to explore some projects with green communities. Green Communities is a state-sponsored uh, organization that is looking to go into uh, municipalities and uh, target uh, energy reductions. Uh, because we are a municipal light plant, um, the participation uh, structure for that uh, is a little bit different. Um, but we are working with them. Um, they have two sources of funding, one that they have collected from ratepayers in other communities. Uh, we're trying very hard to stay away from, from that money. That's somebody else's. But they also have regional greenhouse gas initiative uh, monies that were left over uh, from some penalties collected a few years ago. And some of you may remember a company called Volkswagen Apparently, they did some no-nos uh, <laughs> on their emissions controls, and uh, somebody determined that that was not a good thing, mm -hmm. so they paid a penalty. Uh, those funds are accessible, and uh, we're looking to work with greenhouse communities uh, for some, some grant studies uh, to be able to develop some uh, additional programs, including uh, solar. Uh, with access to those monies. The Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative Reggie funds uh, were from uh, Exxon oil overcharge monies. So um, 
we're going to put them to good use. We're going to try to anyway. So what's going on here in Massachusetts? What, what's the landscape look like uh, here in Massachusetts? For um, municipal light plants, um, they are all moving away from what everybody thinks of as net metering, which is the same price in and out. It is not sustainable. We, we can't continue. And we begin to feel the effects the larger the programs, the solar programs, go. So we're, we're coming up with changes to those models. What happens with that program, uh, you start to transfer uh, the costs from the people who put in solar to everybody else on the system. Initially, to get it going, uh, that was reasonably acceptable. The dollar values were low, and it was a good social and community policy. But as it grows and as more people become interested uh, in doing this, we have to uh, reflect on where the impacts go. And uh, pricing uh, structures uh, and rules that we have to follow in setting rates uh, dictate that user pays and we have to be cost equitable in the things that we do. So uh, we're going to fair rate design uh, for people who are uh, building solar or already have solar, uh, we're looking at charging uh, a facilities fee so that you're paying for access to our distribution system so that you can do that in and out banking uh, that is 55% of the production of your solar facility. Um, we are looking at um, a couple of uh, pricing models for behind the meter. One is that the solar is separately metered and we just buy the uh, output from it uh, at market price. Uh, the other, as I said, is that we have either a facility charge or a backup service charge that gets used. Um, municipal light plants um, also purchase the output uh, delivered to the distribution grid under power purchase agreements. That's basically a contract that says we'll buy the output for 20 years. And we do that from a couple of the projects that we have on our distribution grid. There is an advantage to us from buying from those projects. If we buy them internally, that load doesn't show up on our ISO New England meters. And so we don't pay transmission expense on that. And we don't pay capacity cost on that. So we're able to pass those benefits through in the contract pricing. Uh, makes it a little more attractive, OK? The other thing uh, on uh, Massachusetts solar programs, um, where customer is tax exempt, we are working on leasing strategies. And the leasing strategy means that whoever actually builds and finances the project uh, gets the tax incentives and the lease price uh, to the customer reflects uh, the reduction in construction costs for that, uh, and so the lease price is lower. So it, it's a way of passing that benefit along. So under the solar garden, solar choice concept, uh, what we're looking at is we would build a project, either RMLD or a third party vendor, uh, that project would be sited someplace uh, here in the service territory. Uh, RMLD would pay for the construction of the transformer, the inverter, uh, the, uh, I call it the nest, but it's essentially the uh, panel uh, blocks that you can mount them in. And then we will populate uh, the system with solar panels. Those customers who wish to buy the solar panels, we would charge them the $1.05 per watt cost of the, the panel. They would then own however many panels are in the project. And each month, they would receive a credit on their bill as uh, sort of their return uh, on the investment of the uh, panels. And that, re that return would be equal to the offset price in the market that, that we see from this, and we would uh, recover a lease fee, uh, which would be equal to the cost of the project divided by 20 years. What that does 
that brings the cost of people being able to get into the project, the initial upfront cost, way down. They're still paying uh, the same costs for the transformers and the inverters and, and the rest of the equipment. They're just doing it over time. So we take two-thirds of the project, spread it out over 20 years. The other one-third is the cost of the panels that they pay up front. They're in, and they get a credit on, on their bill. So it's a way of uh, knocking down barriers for people to participate in the projects. That's quite frankly, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars is a little steep for a lot of people to pay. So we we try to get that down. So municipal solar opportunities. Uh, we have rooftop solar uh, that can be behind the meter, or it can be uh, the location where RMLD puts a project, including the solar choice. If we put it up there, we pay a lease fee to. Uh, whatever municipal building it is um, for the use of the roof. So that's where the municipality gets uh, some of its return back. And then we go ahead and uh, construct the project and uh, operate it and take the, the power off it. If it's behind the meter, the municipality has built the project um, and we'll uh, treat that like we would any other generation behind the meter. Um, third party solar uh, would work the same way, except uh, this would be where uh, the municipality would be able to work a lease agreement and sell the output to us, and then the lease agreement get credit for the federal tax. So there, there's all kinds of ways of uh, cutting this one uh, up that we think provide uh, opportunity uh, here in the community. So, um, building owners in the private sector. This tends to be the, the commercial ones. Um, we would encourage power purchase agreements wherever possible uh, because, again, I don't want to have to deal with the phantom loads. Uh, I'd rather have it out on the distribution system. Uh, so we have to come up with a rate that uh, looks like parity and the customer <coughs> really doesn't care which way it goes. They sell it to us. Uh, we have fewer issues to deal with. That would be my choice, but um, we'll also work on synergies with other RMLD energy uh, resource programs. Well, that's a mouthful. What does that mean? We have begun this year a program that we call electrification. That means that we are looking to go into, for example, the transportation sector. We are looking to take gasoline uh, fired vehicles off the road and replace them with electric vehicles. We have committed to and gotten uh, recognition votes from uh, our governing body to acquire non-carbon resources for every electric vehicle that we bring on board or for every heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system that we switch to heat pump. So if we switch to an electrically driven system, we will get non-carbon resources to support it. So that then is the synergies with other programs. We might as well take advantage of the things that we're doing in our community as well and get double bang for the buck. So I, I put a lot of numbers up in here and anybody who uh, grabs a, a, a slide deck will, will provide it. Uh, you can see the sources that I used. Um, these are all um, reputable uh, agencies. The first one on here, uh, for those who are interested in residential solar, that first one is where you go to find out how the new program works and to fill out an application if you're interested in developing your own uh, generation behind the meter program. Um, if you want to find an installer, there's uh, a reference for doing that. Uh, the next two are the sources that I used for national pricing information and um, information on how much a solar system will produce in various areas of the country. The um, presentation is done. Thank you very much, Chuck, for that.
going up right our general managers. Yeah, I, the, so because we're committed to paperless, uh, Joyce will put this up on the website, so we'll be able to call it up and be able to read all the slide decks and everything, and we'll try to get that up tonight, okay? Thank you, Colleen, and um, thank you, Chuck, for that. I think we're going to let people come up to the podium and ask their questions. Um, just a quick thing, I, I really especially appreciated your comments about trying to knock down barriers to residential adoption. One of the, one of the data points, we have 120 uh, residences that have systems. It's, it's actually, the, the four towns are actually among the lowest penetration rates in the state. And um, I think, you know, the, the, the amount of attendance here um, suggests that there's a lot of interest out there. And I think we as a body would like to help reduce those barriers and join with you in that. Um, so with that, what, as I said at the beginning, what I'd like to do is start with any questions that pertain to the municipal side and then questions that are about residential. And, and, and whoever would like to speak and raise their hand, I'll, I'll recognize you and you come up to the podium and, and ask your question from the podium. So um, with that, um, we have a question from Mark Doxer who's on the select board in the town of Reading. Thank you, thought I, I would help kick it off. Uh, my name is Mark Doxer, I'm a Reading resident, member of the, the select board here in Reading. Um, the question I have is you talked about an RMLD project that might be there to work on an RFP to determine solar potential uh, in the municipalities. And I, I would personally and be very interested in learning more about how to, how to do that, how to make that happen. And when it says RMLD project, does that mean RMLD would be kind of initiating or would be willing to initiate that project? Um, I'll have... I mean, certainly from the government governance standpoint, I would be in favor of that. I would defer to Chuck to answer the answer the question. The project that we would look at is if the uh, towns, Reading and the other three, are interested in a project where they would provide a rooftop for us to use as a platform, we would uh, work to study uh, the roofs in each of the towns that determine their suitability based on environmental factors like uh, trees and uh, also uh, have a structural engineer look at the underlying uh, support for the roof to see what kind of loading uh, it would be able to take. The objective would be to go through and identify uh, suitable rooftops in, in each location, prioritize them, uh, determine how much solar could be put on each, and then start moving forward. If the communities want to do uh, behind the meter generation, then what we would do is help with uh, how a lease structure would work. I've put a couple of them in place so we, we can work with that. Um, it's uh, sort of a split approach to uh, dealing with it, and it will depend on uh, our level of involvement in the project. Mark, did that, did you clear on those two different types, the behind the meter versus there's a generator that we'd own, in, in effect? In concept, yes. Okay. Because of the way the town's plan would value it, yep. um, we have done that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, but I, I think what I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that if the municipalities were willing to have the roof speed essentially host to a generating facility that RMLD would control and, you know, purchase all the power or use as a generating source, then we would we would handle all of the RFP for that model. That is correct. Um, so if, if the towns express interest in working with us, uh, we would uh, pull together uh, a proposal uh, to be able to go out and do that. Uh, the size of the and scope of the proposal would be a function of uh, who is interested in uh, going to uh, the market for it. Uh, and then we'd make a choice as to whether we wanted to do it with RMLD resources or whether we wanted to turn it over to uh, a third party uh, solar specialist. Um, I can't give you too much more than that right now because there isn't a lot of structure to it until I get some feedback from the uh, municipalities themselves. And, and the quick follow-up, is, is there any, an advantage to scale? Like if there's many buildings, many towns willing to do an RFP with many potential sites, would that be more attractive or more economical in, in theory or do we know? Well, the, the larger the scale, the, the more communities that participate, uh, the more likely we are to find significantly advantageous sites. 
Each site gets evaluated. We would use the same model that's available uh, through DOER. There's a production evaluation model. And we would go through that and determine uh, what the, the best opportunities in each community uh, would be. So the more communities that participate, the more buildings that we bring into this, uh, the, the better our likelihood of success. Yeah, why don't you come up, Mark, just so everybody can hear. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really quick, how would communities indicate their interest? Would it be select boards communicating their interest to the commissioners, or how, how would it happen? How would you want it to happen to express that? That's questions for, if you, I guess technically you're directing questions to the chair, and I'll say yes, please, <laughs> if your body would like to let ours know, we will relay the message to, uh, to Colleen and and Chuck, um, but I guess that's that's up to you, right? Or do you, is there a better answer than that, Chuck? No, I, I think that's pretty accurate. I think uh, to get the thing started, uh, it starts at the policy level, yep. and that would mean that each of the uh, select boards, I don't know if the school boards uh, would have a separate uh, uh, vote on this or whether uh, the town select boards control it, but an expression of interest from any of the governing boards with roofs uh, in each of the four communities, uh, talks to uh, Dave Talbot. I'm pretty sure he'll be receptive to hearing from you. Um, once that's done, uh, provide the name of a designated contact for uh, each of those. I would assume it would be the facilities manager in the school department or the facilities manager uh, in DPW for uh, the rest of the facilities. And what we would do is start a contact process uh, get an assessment of uh, what the uh, available uh, inventory is of uh, roofs that might participate in that, uh, go out and put together uh, some sort of a scope of work that we could do in an RFP, uh, pass that by each of the communities to make sure we haven't missed anything, uh, get uh, the appropriate uh, outside uh, entities involved, uh, uh, probably a structural engineer to assess the roofs, uh, somebody to run the, uh, the individual roofs through the horizon and uh, total solar assessment, essentially. Um, for those who would like to uh, accelerate the process, I have a stack of business cards here. Mm -hmm. uh, and anybody, uh, residential, commercial, or uh, municipal, is, is welcome to take one. Um, I'm hoping that they all go away soon because then I will be able to go to Colleen and tell her how effective I am. And uh, need a new card with a new title, right? Well, yeah, a new card, new title. <laughs> <laughs> More money. <laughs> um, other questions on the municipal side? We have another from Vanessa Alvarado, who's also on the Reading Select Board. There are no current solar installations on municipal buildings in any of the four communities? That is correct. Okay. What would an ideal solar installation look like, and what, um, what is the number of kilowatt hours that you would like to see coming from these installments, if you have them? I, th I mean, again, I'll defer to Chuck, but I think what Chuck just said was that that uh, this RFP would examine suitable sites and, and pick which ones are the best, and, and the more the more the merrier, and the better sites are the better sites if you have more to choose from. Nothing on size in particular, but if I got the optimum site, it would be a two-story building uh, with no trees on the surrounding five acres, so that I had horizon to horizon, and uh, it would be a flat roof structure so that I could uh, angle my panels for optimum exposure in the appropriate direction. Um, and I, I think, I believe, and you correct me if I'm wrong, you know, the solar developers and the people who would be responding and setting this would have the tools and look at the Google, Google Earth and look at rooftops and exposure, and they would know fairly quickly what those sites that Chuck just described, you know, which ones meet those criteria pretty quickly. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yes. Uh, Chuck, can you just reiterate uh, how many panels are typically on a residential home, and maybe that would, for scale, fit, you could see how many would fit on a typical building? For the average size uh, 
customer in our MLD service territory, the consumption is 9,500 kilowatt hours a year. And in order for a solar system to produce that, uh, the panels are uh, 300 watts a piece. So it takes 6.3 kW, 6,300 watts. That is 11, uh, 21 panels. So that is what you put on your roof. You, there's a panel out in the lobby. It's about, I don't know, four by s the, five, the, the six. The panel in the lobby is three foot wide, six foot tall. Um, I have one other question. Clarification. Oh, Colleen wanted to yeah. add something. Uh, is the MLP incentive based on location, location, location? Uh, meaning that is, uh, if someone is not facing the right direction, does that decrease what they might get for the MLP incentive, or how does that work? No, the, the incentive is paid based on uh, the size of the project. The location, location, location will determine whether uh, essentially a site is go, no go. Uh, so if it exceeds uh, a, a certain rating threshold, if you will, uh, then it would be a go site and it would be entitled to one. If it falls below that and it's not a go site, uh, then it would receive no incentive because uh, we would not be interested in uh, developing something that uh, isn't going to produce. MLP incentive on residential. Oh, I'm sorry. I <laughs> the MLP incentive uh, is also uh, paid the same way. So uh, it, it's a calculation that's done. There is, uh, I don't know whether it's on the Energy New England uh, application site, but there is a, a model where uh, the information is put in. And if it passes and it's accepted for the project, uh, then you get the incentive. There's no derating of the incentive. It's on the residential, right? <coughs> on the residential, and uh, it would be on the municipal and commercial as well. If the project is a go, you get the incentive. Do you have any more on this? Jeff? But I guess for the, uh, hey, the just residential. Please just identify yourself oh, first. Jeffrey Coram. Uh, for the residential one, if you install it in a place that's shaded or you don't have quite the right angle, your payback time would be longer than the seven years, right? Because you wouldn't be generating as much power. You'd get the rebate for the installation, but then you wouldn't pay off the rest of it as quickly, right? Yes. That is correct. <laughs> and it would be even longer if you decided to go ahead with the project and uh, we couldn't justify paying the incentive uh, because of the poor, uh, output quality at that location. So, yes. Jeff, do you have a system at your house? I forget. Okay. Um, were there other questions on the municipal? When, and in that, we could include the commercial side. Please. And, and just identify yourself and where you're from and what your affiliation is, if you could. Uh, my name is Ethan Sawyer. I'm just a resident in Wilmington. Um, but you had mentioned about municipal projects um, that the municipality either had to be the owner of the property or um, basically a tenant for the long-term lease. I just didn't know if maybe you could clarify that, what you would consider a municipal project if it was not municipally owned, but just they had a lease agreement. The lease agreement would be for the solar system itself. Uh, municipal property would be uh, anything that the municipality owns. I'm not aware of any municipal property that are under long-term leases, uh, but if the remaining life on a lease for a municipal property were over 20 years, uh, we would be able to move forward with that. The, the lease part of what I was discussing is how the municipality would acquire the solar. So that instead of buying it outright, they would have somebody else build the project, somebody else would take the tax incentive, and then the price of the lease would be discounted for the tax benefit that that third party uh, got for building it. And I've worked with a number of uh, solar installers uh, that have uh, recognized 
uh, that component uh, of a project structure. So I know that uh, we can do uh, municipal leases and get the, the tax incentive. So, so Chuck, just to clarify, so I'm sure that's I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting to speak, up, speak, speak up, up a bit, Phil. Yeah, let me understand the question. If the municipal does not own the building, but they have a long-term lease, you'd have to deal with the landlord in that case, I would assume, and not the municipal. Is that what your question was getting at? Yeah. yeah. If the landlord was amenable to that, um, yes. It may be that the landlord would be able to uh, install the solar as well. Uh, I, I don't have a good answer for that tonight without a lot more uh, information it coming might be in. It could be a legal question that yeah. needs to be looked at a little bit closer based on whatever site you have in mind. Yeah. Are, are you aware of a specific municipal property that's being that's under a long-term lease? and it's flat. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, again, that's something that uh, we would work with uh, the community on. So uh, we would identify uh, what the issues were and uh, provide uh, what support we can uh, for that. Uh, the same as we would with any other customer that, that came in with, with that kind of a project. I don't think that we would pay the legal expense to get the answer, but uh, certainly we'd, we'd help identify whatever technical uh, issues were associated with a project like that. That would be part of the feasibility analysis, yes. Just make sure, is there any other questions about any like municipal uh, or commercial projects and the, the comments that, that Chuck had? There was? Oh, Vivek, who is, uh, so, uh, identify, uh, I mean, you're on Okay, I'm Vivek Soni, uh, I'm representing Linfield on uh, Citizens Advisory Board. Uh, you, you talked about the 15% limit set on each feeder. Could you explain w what is the basis for that 15% on each feeder? And then I have a question about what happened. I have a follow-up question. The 15% was a number that was established a while back by the Department of Energy uh, simply as a uh, conservative estimate as to how much uh, solar any particular uh, line on the electric distribution system uh, could absorb before it started to notice uh, voltage and current irregularities, uh, issues with power factors. So. Uh, as we look at each feeder, we will get an exact number for it. But right now, uh, absent anything better, uh, we are using the DOE 15%. Okay. And, 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 and so the follow-up was if you, if you had, say, like a school or something else be, which becomes a large lo, you know, solar supplier, then how could that upset that balance? Well, uh, the first answer is it depends on where it is on the feeder. If it is very close to the substation at the uh, early end of the, the feeder, uh, it's easier to, to absorb it. Uh, the second is uh, Hamid's team will do an engineering analysis and determine what the impacts of that are, how much energy is likely to flow back out onto the system at any point in time. Um, and how I, think I, I was just thinking, like, you know, you talk about Linfield, you talk about Essex Street and being the end of the line, and Linfield High School is on Essex Street. And if, if they were to put something up there, then that would be something. Well, I think, Vivek, we, we can get the answer on that specific site. Um, no, but, but the idea was just to yeah. see, like, how would that impact that 15 percent? Yeah. So it was, it was in the context of the 15 percent. And if it was found that 15 percent was a good engineering limit on that particular feeder, what would happen is uh, 
it would scale the size of the project back so that it stayed more internal to that particular facility. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. And I think, I, I mean, I, I looked at some of these numbers. There's a couple of feeders where this might be an issue, but almost everywhere in the district, if I'm not mistaken, we're far from these limits at this time. Yeah, sure. This is Hamid Jafari, uh, Director of Engineering. Hi, I'm Hamid Jafari, Director of Engineering and Operations, basically responsible for keeping your lights on. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> and the reliability system. Great. Thank you. So the, the answer to that question is, yeah, there are some specific sites we might uh, be able to generate more than what the feeder capacity is. That depends on the system. Uh, that's what we do uh, per site system impact study, meaning we're going to consider how much current can the system afford without impacting the what's called in so technical term. I don't want to speak Greek, other languages, but... <laughs> That's basically the, uh, the, the system, uh, system impact study is done to see the number of harmonics because harmonics are like power factor, like the foam on top of the beer. Uh, they're bad. Uh, they're sending to your lines, so it impacts, it distorts the sine wave. So it could impact the operation of your computers at home, your TVs, your other appliances that they're very sensitive. So that's why we do study and see what it could do. And then it is specific in, uh, it is, uh, in some site, we need to uh, install a specific protective devices in order to be able to, when it reaches, it goes over the limit to shut it off. So that's basically how we control that. Um, are, are there any other questions with respect to municipal commercial? Or maybe we can move to the residential side, or are there others? Someone in the back had their hand up in the right, last question. Just residential. Okay. Um, was that question about residential, or are we done with the municipal? Okay. I think we can probably move to that section. So thank you. Uh, so please come on up and identify yourself. So I just inject my voice. No, 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 please. Uh, uh, no, please, ma'am, ma'am. I need you to come up to the podium. Please come up to the podium so that I'm sorry to do this to you, but <laughs> we want to make sure everybody hears you and sees you. Okay. Thank you very much. Just I don't, please let's have your just tell us your name and Janice. address and affiliation from Reading. From Reading. Okay, thank you. I'm just curious. Step one, as a residential person, um, I work at a company where a lot of my fellow employees have already done this in Cambridge, in their homes, and they just said go to Energy Sage, and then you'll get four installers that will contact you, and so on and so forth. And I've been sent a set of instructions, and I understood you to say that. That won't work because we're a municipal. And so I'm trying to understand what is my step one. And after I understand, uh, since you did talk about find an installer, I still think that's close to my step one, is the feasibility and engineering check for line conditioning, beer foam, et cetera, going to happen <laughs> for you, from you guys using your time and energy and re employees for each individual residential home? If so, is there a queue that's going to develop? And if I want the discount by the end of the year, I had better hurry my little self to the front of the line? Or, like, how does this work? In very simple, basic, checkbox kind of terms. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great question. I other people have the same question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. Uh, excellent. Um, is there anybody here that actually has a solar system installed? Perfect. Okay. Correct me if I get this wrong and, and the process is updated a little bit. But your first step, contacting uh, and getting four solar installers, is fine. It doesn't mean that those installers can't put the system on your house. If you plan to buy the system or if you plan to lease the system, but if they come in and say they'll put the system in and they will sell you the output every month for 15% less, they're done. You, we can't use them in an MLP. So as long as you're buying the system, installing it on your roof, perfect start. Now, as to the rest of it, when you make an application, 
you will go to the Energy New England webpage and begin the application process. That is to apply for the rebate for your system. We will do the test. We will have that uh, evaluation done that looks at where your system is, the orientation, and take a look at the total solar output as a, potent as a percent of the potential. That passes, you're in line for a rebate. That's just a long rebate? No, it will not be that long. But, but we, we haven't done any yet. This was just launched about two weeks ago. But I can't imagine that it's going to take more than a week or two to process those. And if it does, give me a call. No, step one was to call your installers and find out, yep, they will do an evaluation of how much solar you need to serve your bill. They will get a cap. They will get 12 months of history. They will take a look at it and say, okay, this is how much you use, how much of your system or how much of your use do you want to offset. They will size the system for you. Then you've got something you can take as and fill out an application with. We would love to have the extra, <laughs> um, but the rule is that you shouldn't build a system larger than your own need. We, re we restrict it to people's own need. We I, don't I think what we ought to do is we ought to make sure there's clear information. If it's not already available on the website, there's a clear FAQ or primer that we can give out because everybody's going to have the similar, these are great questions that you have. I just want to make sure that, that everybody who has those questions can go to our website and get those answers clearly spelled out. We can write them. Yeah. Maybe he can answer the question. So. Answer the, question. Yeah. the immediate uh, question to why do we limit to uh, your own consumption? Um, the we is RMLD. And the limit is there to protect the other ratepayers on the system. Because until we get some of the pricing issues resolved, uh, you're generating extra beyond your own need, which is what the program was intended uh, to cover, then forces other ratepayers into a higher cost structure uh, for that. Now, if you want to build a much larger system and direct connect to the grid, we would buy all of the output from you. Uh, and we have customers that do that on larger scale projects. But for residential, the program was designed so that you could generate your own requirement. We will act as a bank for you. We've got to put cost structures in place so that we recover fair facilities charge and backup service charge for what we're providing. And once those are in place, um, everything's back to equitable. But the intent of the program was that people would be able to generate their own use, not that of the entire community. So, other questions um, over here, and then John. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Actually, I have a couple slides. Can I? Uh, sure. Can we? Can we do that? Can we? We can work on putting that in if yeah. we want to take some other. Yeah. Why don't we? Yeah. Why don't you do? Yeah. While he's putting that in, uh, let's take another question. While the, who else had a question? I saw a hand somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. They're all back here. Okay. Uh, Sir, come on up. Before you do yeah. That, yeah. I just want to make sure you're okay with this. I'm not supposed to put flash drives where you don't know the origin uh, well, of the point. Yeah, you're not supposed to put that in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. Okay. All right. If he can use his laptop instead, we can take a couple other. I would yeah. That's fine. Okay. Fine. Fine. Okay. You can't. You can't put. You can't plug the AV into his laptop. If, you, if you've got your own computer, you should be able to do that because okay. that just melts everything. Okay. Okay. That just goes sure. into this. Maybe you have that right now. Okay. This is. Yeah. Come on up and let's uh, let's take your question while we figure out the technical piece here. 
just identify yourself and town and affiliation, please. Uh, my name is Dan Covey. Yep. I live in North Reading. Yep. I have solar on my home. Yep. Full disclosure, I've been in the solar industry about a decade. Good. Um, so I'm up here to get a couple pieces of clarification from the presentation. Um, and also, this all comes respectfully. I really appreciate you guys doing this. Um, I think by the uh, turnout here and um, just what I do in my day-to-day -day life, uh, there's a lot of interest here. And I think we could do a lot better than our penetration is already. I think we could do that. Um, <coughs> sure. Yeah, One of the points I wanted to get clarification on is that the way I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, we do not have net metering in our MLD territory, the way net metering is defined. We have live bi-directional metering, which is a big difference on the financials, meaning all day long when you're at work and you're cranking out all this juice from your solar installation and you're not having consumption, you're selling back at a very low rate fuel surcharge, four cents a kilowatt hour right now. We all pay 18 and a half cents a kilowatt hour. When you come home and the sun is not shining and you're consuming electricity, you're paying 18 and a half cents a kilowatt hour. So that throws the financials off substantially. Um, for the 45-55 split that you brought up, that brings that payback out to 11 and a half years, not six years, unless I'm missing something with the math. So my, that's my main question is, can we get clarification on that? And an independent of clarification, I hope that we're working towards something that's better than that. I understand that net metering is costly, but there's a lot of studies out there that say that, um, that and I can cite them, that n there's a net benefit for all ratepayers with net metering, social benefits of, of a carbon offset, um, not new power stations that need to be built because of the electrification that we're promoting here. Um, and also, in other communities that are municipal light plants, like Concord, for instance, there's well over 400 residential installations. We have four communities here, and there's about 100. So we're definitely behind the eight ball. And the part about the rebate, which I think is great, we have a year to chew up $500,000. At the average system size, that's about 50 projects. So I'm hoping that when that rebate ends, that RMLD can come up with something to continue solar adoption because it's not going anywhere. Fossil fuels, there's a, pr a push against them for a lot of reasons. And I think if we don't, in RMLD, come up with something better, we're going to be behind the eight ball about all of our neighboring communities. That's really my, my it's not really a question, no. I guess. There's more clarification. That's, I, that's, thank you very much for that comment. And um, one question I would like to know is how many um, of the municipal light plants have the type of payment structure that we have that you described and how many have the Concord style um, approach. And I, you know, that's an answer that I should know and I would like to know it, you know, and sort of know where we stand. Um, so I don't know if we can answer that tonight or it's just a question for us to be thinking about as a, as a body in the coming months. The cost information that I put up there at the 6.6 .6 years does include using RMLD's buyback at the energy rate. The energy rate is the market energy offset price at four cents a kilowatt hour. Um, the use of a net metering process the way everybody understands it, same cost in and out, uh, is not sustainable. If we did the entire system uh, at that price, we would be out of business. We would have no money to maintain the facilities uh, and, and provide that uh, interchange service that all of the solar projects rely on. And since most of the energy that is being produced uh, is in that bank, over 50% uh, percent of it, as opposed to direct consumption by the consumers. Maintaining that distribution system is an integral part of a successful solar program. Keep in mind, we're consumer-owned. There's, there's no profit that goes out of the system anywhere. So all we're doing is trying to balance equity, fairness, and maintain a cost structure uh, that will uh, sustain us well into the future while still meeting carbon reduction goals. We're currently negotiating with the state as to what those carbon reduction goals ought to be. And 
we're beginning that aggressive uh, process of gaining non-carbon resources into uh, our system, including the solar production. What will happen at the end of the year in terms of the rebate? We will go back to our original rebate structure. I don't have the numbers in front of me. It's a little less uh, generous than uh, the current state program is, but that is what we would revert to. Uh, and it would uh, put us save a uh, simple payback up towards where the commercial payback numbers that I put on the board uh, are. So, um, Chuck, just I, 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 I just like to add one thing to what Chuck had mentioned here. I'm John Stempe uh, on the board. And uh, the, uh, the point that we are we're basically um, cost effective as an arm or an RMLD as a municipal a light department is very real. If you compare our rates, which I hope you all of you have, with National Grid or with Eversource, you'll find that your rates are one third to one half of what they charge. I know because I personally have a property in another territory where I have National Grid, and it's it's about double what I pay there for the same amount of electricity as we would pay at RMLD. And that's because we we pass everything along, all these cost savings to all of us in the room, including all of us, and that's really what our focus is. But we're a fixed cost organization. We cut to the bone in terms of our staff and everything else to keep this being just as, as uh, efficient as possible for everyone. And that's why some of these numbers may be slightly off in terms of perhaps what others are paying. But, but that's, that's, that's the point. Um, I, I just, I still, you know, one of our few jobs as commissioners is to set rates. And so I would like to understand, um, thank you, John, by the way, um, is to better understand where we stand in the spectrum of municipal light plants in the state um, on this yeah. question that just came up. And so, you know, how many, Chuck, the question that I still have, whether we get it tonight or in the future, is how many of the light plants, you know, where do we stand on the, on the spectrum of our generosity, if you will, of treating the purchase power as we do with the four cents or versus the more generous Concord methodology? How many are in the, each camp and where do we stand? I can pull those yep. statistics together. Uh, I actually pulled them together about eight months ago okay. uh, for my prior employer. Um, so I, I, I'm familiar with where to find them. Okay. Um, in terms of full service charge versus the energy charge, we're about on a par. Uh, I do know that other utilities don't offer an installation incentive uh, for the solar up front. So the customers are bearing the full cost of the uh, installation on that. Um, so in other words, the, maybe we're not so generous on that piece, but we are more generous. Okay. So yeah. it's just we need to better understand it as a board is my takeaway. Um, and we have a, a yeah. and, uh, question. Next, yeah. next question. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Jim Greer. I'm very new in town, just moving into North Reading. Um, I'm one of the few people who moved into this area who's paying more for electricity now because they live in Groton currently, which I think is second lowest in the state, also in NLD, of course. Uh, and Groton still remembers when Reading covered for us during the uh, ice storm uh, 12 years ago and saved our, uh, <laughs> <laughs> our, yeah. our lines. Yeah. Yes. So, I've been looking at putting solar on my house for about 20 years now. I'm a procrastinator. Uh, the, the cost has never quite Welcome. been where it is, it's, but uh, I'm looking at it again, but I'm fascinated by the solar garden thing. It sounds like a, a way to bank the, the access uh, without having to put my house, because my house, once again, doesn't quite face the way I'd really want it to face. It's great for looking at the water, but not so much the sun. And I got this wonderful tree, <laughs> so, um, and so I'm I'm very interested in that. But I'm also interested where you're at with storage because I'm very much interested in what can be done with uh, storage in the house. Um, if I go to the split building, then I can you know offset. I do have a sol uh, an electric car, so I'm sensitive to the yep. overnight charging. Uh, but the peak rate during the day would hurt. So. Uh, what's your thoughts on 
you know, the various battery technologies that are going on in the house as opposed to in your system, which I'm glad to see you've got the peak reduction batteries as well. I'll give that to Chuck, but I just want to brag on RMLD a little bit in that we got the biggest grant in, in the Commonwealth for a, a, a grid battery that's been installed in North Reading, and that's something we're very proud of on the, on the distribution grid. But as to the individual homeowner battery storage, Chuck. Yeah. Um, the project he's referring to, we put in a 5,000 kW, 10,000 kilowatt hour battery project. Uh, we got a $1 million grant from uh, the Department of Energy Resources, DOER, uh, for that project. We completed construction on it at the beginning of this month. It is uh, commercially active, and uh, we have a uh, ribbon cutting for it next month. So we're kind of excited about having gone that way. Um, batteries are the key. Uh, you're right for, for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the things, and I don't know where you are during the day, but uh, if you plug your electric vehicle in between 10 o'clock in the morning and 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a sunny day, you will be reducing the amount of kilowatt hours that flow back out onto uh, the grid for, for banking purposes and offsetting uh, more of the uh, energy that you would otherwise be purchasing from us. Okay, well, uh, yeah. I, I'd say leave the car home, but I suspect you, you have it for commuting purposes. Um, but uh, and I'm going to be in trouble with the boss for having said that afterwards, because I'm not supposed to be discouraging electric sales. Um, but we don't have economically functional batteries at this point. Uh, there is a product out there uh, today, uh, the Tesla Wall. Uh, that is available. It is a um, uh, rack of uh, batteries. I believe lithium ion uh, uh, are the, f the functional chemical mechanism for it. And uh, I don't have an awful lot of information on uh, the size of the packages and the cost effectiveness. I do believe there are a couple that are installed here on our s territory. I looked into this about a year and a half ago with Tesla wall mounted batteries, calling Tesla and getting a, a quote on them for my house, my standard size house, was about $37,000, just for the battery packs, just for the battery packs. You said 37000 not 3700 right? That's correct, <laughs> yes. How many did you get, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> so he only, got, he only got two of them. Was, um, you got two. Wow. I thought they were, I thought they were $5,000 per unit. No, they're, they're, they're big units. Okay. So. <laughs> Year and a half old. Anybody have more information, please? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, that was an, an important enough data point. If you could, do you mind? Yeah. Just yeah. come on. Yeah. Yeah. So that way, everybody, there's, a thou there's thousands of people watching on TV right now. They're lined up. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have giant screens out on the street. Wait a minute. Right. The, <laughs> the, the NBA draft. That's true. So just yeah, give us your name, your name, and your. Just looking. Yeah. So okay, just give us your name and your uh, yes. uh, in, in town. And uh, all. I'm Jack Antari. I just moved to Reading like six months back. Yep. Um, so yeah, the power wall cost about seven thousand eight hundred per wall. Okay. So for uh, and it serves about. Uh, a four kilovolt uh, system. So if you are installing for 12 kilowatt system, you will need probably two to three. So 14,000 to max 20,000. Well, it's come down significantly. Yeah, it's come down significantly compared to the year. Plus yeah. Oh, plus the installation. Pl oh, no, installation is included. Was okay. included? Oh, yeah. Well, that's interesting. Do you, do you know what the energy storage to uh, battery size is? You said it was 4 kW. 4 kW. How many kilowatt hours does that store? For example, I know we put in batteries that will, uh, in their configuration, uh, deliver 5 kW, uh, 5,000 kW, mm -hmm. but they will only do it for two hours, so it's 10,000 kilowatt hours. So for the 4 kW, how many hours of storage do you get? So unless you use, use up all of that, so it doesn't tell how many hours of it. Uh, so, so the thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I have a follow-up question on yeah. that. So does the rebate apply to the power wall as well? Yeah. 
have obstruction of justice. So does it just apply to the, so because fe federal rebate, the 30% tax rebate applies on the power all itself too. Okay. Is that a statement or a question? No, that was a statement. Okay. The question is the RMLD rebate applies to the power wall. No, we don't have one yet. So he's asking what? Power 20 per watt is for the solar system itself. Yep. Uh, we do not have anything in place with respect to uh, a power wall uh, rebate at this point. Okay. But if that's included in the project, then the federal government would give uh, the okay. credit against that. Yep. So. And that also would mitigate somewhat against the issue that was discussed earlier of uh, the amount that we're paying during the day. Instead, you'd put it into your battery. Yeah, so there's another question. Okay. Uh, we'll yeah. Uh, yeah, please. Sure. We'll come on up. Yeah, and then we'll and then we'll get to uh, John, who has his a couple slides, I think. Yep. And uh, <coughs> so just let us know who you are. Um, Andrew Hikati. Uh, I work for Revision Energy. In North Andover, um, one power wall is 13 and a half kilowatt hours of usable storage. Um, your average household uses about 20, between 21 and 27 kilowatt hours per day. Um, usually, you put it into some sort of you critical loads that you power, or you can go with two power walls. Um, so that's kind of how they work. It has five kilowatts, what you were referring to, five kilowatts of continuous output. So it can put out five kilowatts for 2.7 hours, which is that 13 and a half kilowatt hours. So anyway, <laughs> if anybody has any other questions about that, I'm, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Yeah. And I think we had uh, John Rogers had something he wanted to hit. We've solved the technical issue, hopefully. The hackers are not at work now. Uh, I hope not. That's the my billing job. system, if you see very uh, large bills <coughs> from, anyway. Right. My name is John Rogers, and I live in North Reading, uh, and I, I do work in, in energy. Uh, so I just wanted to give some context, follow, follow up on what Dan said in some of the discussion here about where RMLD sits now. If you look at the, I think you mentioned 351 cities and towns in, uh, oh, that's a problem. My, mine's not plugged in. <laughs> so, uh, so if you think about those 351 cities and towns, uh, I actually cut out the three largest because they just, you know, Boston, Springfield, uh, Worcester mess up the grass, the graph. But basically, you think about the number of households and the penetration rate. Next, so this is that distribution. This is what it looks like. So you see a lot of small communities that have pretty high uh, rates of of penetration of solar. Uh, next, please. Those four red dots. One more, please. Th those are us. Those are the four RMLD communities. So counting Linfield as an RMLD community in, in whole. But that's where we sit. And there are a lot of reasons. You know, you heard we have more trees. Maybe we have, you know, you think about owner-occupied versus renters. I think we'd actually, I think that would tilt things towards solar. Think about the low cost, the lower cost of electricity in RMLD. That would tilt things away from solar. A lot of different reasons. But uh, one more click. A lot of trees. This shows other MLPs, all the other municipal <coughs> light plants. So those 50, the other 46 communities in Massachusetts. Um, so you can see that there are some that are up at 2%, 5%, even 10% penetration rates. Next, please. This is the average of for the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, 5.6%, meaning 5.6% of the households have solar, roughly. These numbers are a little rough. The, the average across the municipal light plants is 1.1%. And RMLD is at 0.4, 0.42%. So that suggests that even if our th there are issues with adoption, with penetration, with wires, whatever, uh, we've got some running room here. Can you go to the next one? Here's another way of looking at it. These are all the communities. So you got communities, you got one community that's up at 35%. Um, here, click again, please. Those are the RMLD communities there. One more click. Those are the MLPs, again, the other municipal light plants, so much like us in a lot of cases. And, and I'll just zoom in on those. Again, there are the MLPs, so low, you know, low rates like ours. Communities, in some cases, very similar to ours, some very close to here. Um, and, here's, and here's where our four communities are. Again, uh, so if you look at those 351 towns, we're not in the top 90-something percent of those in terms of penetration. So this is terrific information. This is really important to hear uh, what, what Mr. Underhill was saying. 
we have opportunities. I think we've got we could we could go a whole lot farther before we start running into some of the some of the genuine issues that you would see. One more click. Um, so again, uh, if you if you think of us down there, one more click. Um, the, the other perspective is to think about this from the customer's perspective. So we're worried about this being too rich for customers, <laughs> solar adopters. Click, please. So if you think about um, how much gets exported to the grid, so we heard, I mean, you were saying it's good if they're exporting in the middle of the day, right? That's when the community needs it. One more click. It turns out that the economics, and, and there are some assumptions down here, but the economics work well if you keep, if you, the homeowner, keep all the power to yourself. Because, and I was, I was really glad to hear what you said about what, how we get compensated, but that's not how it's working for my system. Every kilowatt hour that leaves my house, not a monthly, not at the end of the month, but totaling, every kilowatt hour that leaves my house at any time of day, I get paid five cents, four cents for. When I buy it back 15 minutes later, it's 11 or 15 or 18 cents. And that's, that's what these economics are based on. That's what my home system. So I, I love, and I think you're right, and I think that's the way the policy was written originally. I don't, that's not how it's being implemented, so I'd love to talk about that. So uh, next click. So anything else, if you export anything to the grid, if you don't store it, if you don't use those batteries, if you don't consume it in your electric vehicle or your heat pump or your water heater right then, the economics really tank. Uh, another click, please. And that's weird because we've got, how many of you got this email two days ago? Shred the peak that they're saying, please help us because things are really expensive at the expensive time of the day and that heat. That's when our solar systems could be producing, particularly a west-facing system like mine, late afternoon, that should be worth gold. And I get four cents a kilowatt hour for those, those kilowatt, for those, uh, that export. So next, next slide. So if we want people to adopt solar, and that's why we're committing a quarter of a million dollars plus a quarter million of the, of the state's money if we want to, if we want get to get people to adopt solar, we got to do something better. So it, it was worrisome to hear actually the talk about a facilities charge and going to a buy all, sell all, because I'll tell you, facilities charge is incredibly controversial in Arizona, which you referred to earlier. Um, they really, I mean, pitchforks and torches kind of controversial. Um, so I don't think, uh, I mean, it's good to be thinking long term. Again, we're nowhere near, I think, where we need to be thinking about that. Um, next, please. RMLD has done so many good things. You know, early on, the, how many of you were in the Green Choice program where you could buy renewable energy? Sorry, renewable energy. Yeah, Green Choice, I think it was called. There's the Solar Choice program now. There's electric vehicle incentives. There's uh, efficiency incentives. There's the battery, the storage, all these things moving toward electrification. Rooftop solar, next, it should be part of that solution. It is part of that solution. RMLD has not embraced that yet, and it would be great to find a way to do that. Thank you. Thanks for Thank, you Thank you. Uh, before we go back to you, is there any more questions, and then we'll we'll take a couple. Okay, sure. Let's let's come on up and, and ask your question. Yeah, and while you're coming up, Tom O'Rourke's going to ask his question. Yeah, just uh, Chuck. Thank you, uh, Tom O'Rourke, one of the uh, board members. Uh, Chuck, back to the. Original question, I want to make sure uh, I got it right as to what the next step is. So uh, get the installer, uh, buy the equipment, apply for the application. That was what I thought I heard. And, and my only concern, maybe I'm missing something. So at that stage, once you purchase the equipment, if, if you do the feasibility and it's a, a no-go, are we stuck there or maybe there's another part to the process? Maybe I'm missing that. So. Well, the, the feasibility and the determination of the rebate is the step after you select a supplier yep. and evaluate the potential, but before you install the equipment. So you would have a choice uh, based yeah, on... Before you purchase the equipment. Before you purchase yeah, it. Okay. You, you would be advised uh, whether you qualified for in an incentive based on the production capability at that location. So you would have a choice at that point whether you wanted to proceed with the project without the incentive or whether you, uh, if you got the incentive, you'd, you'd go ahead and, and proceed with so the you, project. You wouldn't purchase the equipment until after you had the feasibility then? I wouldn't, no. Okay. Um, All right. And sir, I just 
Sure. Re-identify yeah. yourself. Sure, Ethan Sawyer, Wilmington. Um, I get. I mean, the, this presentation that John did was. I mean, definitely had a lot of information in it. Uh, the one thing that it, I'm a tax preparer. When I work with my clients, most of the people who have solar on their homes, they're leasing it. They're not purchasing it because that thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar purchase price is scary. Um, even though I think that's the better way to go. But so I think that the reason that, that the MLPs, the municipal light, are a much lower penetration rate is because of that. You know, customers here only have the option to buy, basically, right? So I mean, I think that kind of throws the numbers off. Um, that was the only point that I wanted to make. That's a good point. Thank you for that. Good input. Um, when you say that they're leasing, are they leased, Are they buying the kilowatt hour output from a third party vendor, or are they actually doing a lease, which is a fixed monthly payment for the system? That, that's currently a structural limit that we can't yeah, yeah. bypass. Um, part of what affects the cost effectiveness is that uh, our kilowatt hour rates are lower than, than grid, so the offset uh, is much different. Uh, we've been batting around 16 and 18 cents. Uh, let, me, let me clarify what's going on with that. The 18 cents is the, is the value of the bill that goes out from RMLD, but there's a prompt payment discount. Since 97% of our customers take advantage of that prompt payment discount, I think it's fair to reflect that in the uh, sort of true cost of electricity. So that gets it down to uh, a shade over uh, 16 cents at that point. So uh, I just want to be clear on that. Um, one thing, and, and I'm not trying to sound defensive about this, but uh, the solar choice option is there uh, so that people who don't have uh, those large upfront resources available can get into it. That does offset, though, the, the number of residential customers that are participating because they're doing it through a different program that, that isn't counted as solar on the residential roof. So uh, I, I'm just trying to be as uh, fair and clear as I can. Uh, it's one of the reasons we do the Solar Choice Program. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, that opportunity uh, should be reflected in, uh, you know, sort of where we sit. It's, it's not going to move us to the top of the pile overnight, but uh, I, I do think it's fair to consider uh, all of the uh, opportunities that we make available, and as I said at the beginning, why we make some of those things available. Are there any more questions that haven't come up yet? Uh, one in the back there, please. Just uh, let us know who you are, what town you're from, what affiliation. And, uh, Reading, uh, just a question as far as maintenance of these solar panels, wind storms, snow, how do you take care of them or do you take care of them or do you need insurance? If they are behind the meter, uh, it's either the leasing company uh, that takes care of them or you own them and you have insurance that takes care of them. It would be like any other appliance in your home. Uh, we're not responsible for the refrigerator, uh, the washing machine, okay, maybe the dryer, but uh, no, if you've got a panel, uh, set of panels on your roof, you're responsible. Uh, in addition, uh, on the maintenance, uh, it isn't just weather-related activities. Uh, you do have to watch for uh, the holes that are drilled through uh, the roofing material, whether it's uh, shingle rubber or asphalt shingles. Uh, so uh, those are often issues that uh, uh, you want to check uh, after two years and every year thereafter to make sure that uh, you don't have a, a problem developing uh, on your roof. Sir, you had a hand signal over here and then we'll... I'm Bruce McKenzie of Reading. Um, although the Reading power is very reliable, it can fail. 
and I was hoping that um, the rooftop solar could at least power my furnace and my refrigerator when the grid was down. I, we looked into this a few years ago, and there was no reasonably priced equipment that could disconnect the house from the grid. So, so I understand for safety reasons, you don't want, you know, the, you want to disconnect the solar panel. But is there any equipment that can still leave the house connected to the solar panel? Yes. Um, the question is, in the event of an outage, will the solar uh, system carry uh, the house? And is there a way of doing a disconnect uh, from the grid during an outage so that the, the solar uh, can be used? Uh, that type of a structure is a double pole, double tail switch that you would use for a normal generator. So the, the equipment is available. The problem is that the inverters that come with the solar systems as a protective device uh, de-energize and shut down the system in the event of loss of power. So the solar system in an outage won't carry uh, your facility. Uh, you don't have uh, uh, AC uh, signal uh, to feed the solar system with without the, the power grid. So uh, it will uh, also not function in a storm. You need a battery. You need a battery. Yeah. You would need e a battery. Even with the battery, okay. uh, it won't function because it needs the synchronization signal uh, from uh, the grid to power the inverter. Uh, they've changed that now. That, sa that safety has been disconnected. Okay. Could you come up and explain that, please? Please, yeah, come on up. Um, so yeah, the uh, Tesla Energy Gateway will, or the Powerwall system, I guess, one of the Powerwall terms, uh, will isolate from the from the grid, and uh, your solar array can power your battery. Uh, it works almost exactly the way a generator relay works. Um, so it isolates the grid, so you can't backfeed it, because that's the big the big danger here. Um, and so these Tesla Powerwalls can can do that. Tesla Energy Gateway is the, is the device that does that. Um, as far as a question, um, you had mentioned, yeah, go for it. Um, just one point of clarification. Uh, that is the interjection of a battery system. And I, and I agree the battery will do it. But a standalone solar system without that Tesla wall right. does disconnect from the grid. So it d unless you put a battery system in, your solar system will discorrect, disconnect and fail to operate. That is a safety mechanism that's, that's put in. With the batteries, yes, you can, yeah, you can do it. Exactly. Okay, I, I just wanted to make that clarification. And again, that's a safety, that's a safety thing. Like you don't want people working on the lines and then backfeeding the grid and getting electrocuted. Um, right out. So, so uh, for the MLP rebate, you said that uh, you could size a system for for their use, can you size it for like future use? So say they're planning, the customer's planning to get a, a electric vehicle. Um, some of them have like some some plans have like 120 percent of their of their current usage or something. Anyway, um, I don't have a good answer for that right now. That it's almost a case by case review on that. The, the program is basically you size it for your use. So if you know you demonstrate that you're on a Tesla waiting list, you've been on it for two years, you're expecting uh, that in the next eight months it's going to come off. Uh, yeah, we we would probably uh, allow for uh, that. If you're going to buy an electric vehicle and charge it someplace else. Uh, that might be a little dicey. So I, I would say, uh, you know, we'll review it on a case-by-case -case basis. We're trying to encourage this stuff. Please don't get us wrong. Uh, so, yeah, we, we want to make sure that it happens. We just want to make sure that it happens so that it doesn't adversely impact uh, other people on the system uh, and still allows uh, customers to develop uh, what they would like to for their interests. Um, Question, sir. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Jim Conlon. I'm from Drake It. Uh, I'm, I'm an installer, electrician. 
A um, couple clarifications. One, sir, on the maintenance. We want to make sure that the, the, probably the most important maintenance item is your trees. You want to keep your trees cut back for shading and for squirrels. Squirrels will, will, will wreck your system faster than just about anything else will. Um, they, it's nice and warm and cozy under there. Um, apparently they like the wires. So that's one. Two, um, uh, on the, if power goes down, there are systems that you can get some power out of. Uh, there's a type of inverter that when the grid is down, you can shut your, you can shut the inverter off, but there's a switch that you can get about 2,000 watts out of during the day when the sun, when the sun is shining. So you could run your refrigerator, your freezer, something for those times. It's the linemen are safe, um, but it's a, it is an option. It's not used much, you know, but uh, it's, it's available. So, um, I'd like to ask a question about the inverter. Is that a second inverter that goes into a cutout, or is it the, the only inverter and it just switches its uh, functioning capability? No, it's a sunny boy. It's an SM. Uh, <laughs> uh, the SMA, uh, the SMA sunny boy uh, inverters. They they used to be the norm. Uh, they were the go-to for for quite a while, and. Uh, Last few years, things have switched over with optimizers, and uh, Solar Edge has become the norm. Uh, but I've been using SMAs now for special projects, and that's one of the functions of them that that come in pretty handy. And it's the same; you're not paying any extra. So, any other questions? Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. I'm willing to learn too. So, <laughs> one quick one from John. You had your uh, presentation. Just a quick uh, break, briefly, and then. Maybe so, we'll sorry, and I'll say I, I was flustered by the uh, laptop issue. I did want to say thank you so much for doing this solar workshop. Again, you got a great crowd, great information. Um, and to your, one, of your, one of your last comments, uh, I don't think we need to be at the top of the pack. I just don't want to be at the bottom of it or at the back of it. So I think um, figuring out how to make it work for customers, both solar and non, um, recognizing the full value of solar, so it's more than the five cents a kilowatt hour that I'm getting for that power because of all the other issues that you brought up about transmission and distribution and all. Uh, recognizing that value and integrating that into all the good things that RMLD is doing. So thank you, um, and I, I'm happy to be part of that conversation going forward. Thanks, John. Any, any other, uh, okay, but one last question there. Maybe we'll, I think we're gonna call it at 9 p.m. and I think we plan to do a two hour solar workshop. And so, so you can make the concluding remarks and sort of wrap up the lessons learned from tonight. <laughs> Let us know who you are. So um, my name is Peter uh, Crocky. I'm a relatively recent Reading Regis resident, um, also an engineer. Um, so my question is actually a little more technical in nature. I was a little bit late. Could you explain um, for non-technical people uh, what the issues are with phantom loads? And is this like the duct, duct curve idea in California, or is this different? Could you maybe explain a little more? It's something like the duct curve, um, and it would take me longer than I'm going to be allowed to explain what a duct curve is. But essentially, when you put a solar system in and you're providing for a portion of your load, especially when you're providing for it directly, we don't see that. We don't know what that is anymore. And we have to size the system to be able to deliver uh, whenever somebody wants a kilowatt hour, we can't create uh, a line, okay? We're not like market basket that you can back people halfway up the aisles. Uh, somebody turns something on, uh, they expect electricity. So that has to be provided. And for us, anything that is served by solar behind the meter is a load we're unaware of. So it is for us what I would call a phantom load. Does that, I yeah, mean, out of your head, yeah. so. Thank you. Um, everybody's good. I think we're, we're very, very grateful for people for coming out. You know, we get very lonely up here a lot. We don't get too. <laughs> people don't, they don't come. They don't write. They don't call. And uh, here you all are. So please come back and keep the dialogue going. We have public comment at the beginning of every meeting, and happy to continue these conversations. You know, write to uh, Colleen or Chuck. Uh, there, I mean, really appreciate, and, and yes, yes, and I just want to uh, thank you guys very much for, yes. for doing so this. So up next, not tonight, 
but an electric vehicle workshop coming. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. And, and we have a big round of applause for the, for yeah. Colleen and Chuck for doing. Uh, This was a bit out of the norm, and they, they spent the extra time, and I think we're all very grateful for that, and Absolutely. we'll look forward to keeping up the dialogue with everybody. So thank you very much. Good. Okay. Drive safely. Yeah. And if you want to have the rest of the meeting, we have a few bids that we're voting on. and uh, <laughs> like Minutes. We're going to approve minutes. Um, Chair, we take a five-minute recess. Take a five-minute recess. Five recess. Okay. Okay. And yes. They change the room over. Tesla, because I wish we all. I saw you nodding when you were talking about the Tesla. You waiting? Are you waiting for one? <laughs> Where do you live? Oh, uh, okay. We keep talking okay. these microphones like we have. Come here to charge your car. You don't do buy a Tesla. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's take a five-minute recess.